guest today is Dave Pine. Dave, how are you, sir? I'm fantastic. I'm doing very well. Um, how are you? I'm staying safe here during these crazy times. Yeah, indeed. It is very crazy out there. Um, you're in Chicago, right? I'm in downtown Chicago. Where are you? Uh, Milwaukee. So just north of you, like 90 miles. I've been there many times. It's a beautiful. Awesome. City. I love the lakefront there. Yeah, it's, it is beautiful. Um, not quite as windy as uh, Chicago, but... Chicago is the windy city. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and Milwaukee is the, the cream city? What is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, cream city. Um, so there, there's an old story about that. Everyone asks, you know, why cream city and what does that really mean? And so the roots are that when uh, some of the early buildings were being constructed, they used local clay and the bricks actually ended up being cream in color. So mm. I got the nickname cream city because the, the concrete brick buildings were all cream. It's 10 o'clock in the morning and I've already learned something new. <laughs> that's a, a good, good thing day. yeah <laughs> and what do you do in cream city uh well so i'm uh part of the the docs team here at microsoft so i work remotely um and i'm a senior content developer for the net docs um so yeah my i guess my day job is is kind of um being uh, a contributor to the open source um repository that is .net slash docs and it's um it's an amazing you know journey to kind of be a part of docs.microsoft.com and uh you know just the traffic alone that the the site gets and the attention and the emphasis on you know technical content development and um, being a part of developer relations it's all very humbling now well uh, so you've been working remotely for a while so you're used to what a lot of folks are yeah, just yeah, to... yeah. So I mean, I've only worked for Microsoft just over a year now, um, and before that, I was a technical evangelist for a consulting firm here in the Midwest. Um, so, being 100% remote for just over a year, uh, I guess it was a great segue into the new norm that is remote remote work now. So I'm very grateful to work for such an awesome company. What's your team focused on now? What do you? Uh, uh, what, what sort of things are coming up that you have to document? Uh, so the big thing for us in the in .NET land is uh, they've called it the .NET five wave. So if you've been following .NET, um, .NET uh, probably four or five years ago came out with what was called .NET Core, and .NET Core was um, kind of revisioning how .NET framework. Um, you know, like the source code and the capabilities and the API surface area would live in a cross-platform uh, ecosystem. So mm -hmm. it introduced .NET Core, and .NET Core is, uh, it's amazing. Um, and it's, I think the latest version is .NET Core 3.1. That's the their LTS, you know, long-term support. Um, so with .NET 5, what they're actually doing is they're kind of taking a step back and they're saying, you know, we've had .NET Framework, which is specific to Windows for a long time, uh, and .NET Core, which is cross-platform, better, a lot more performant. It's built in the open, so being open source on GitHub, you know, anyone can go contribute to it. They can kind of see all the inner workings of the runtime. Uh, they can contribute to it, obviously. They can post issues, and it's, it's really, uh, I guess, a better way uh, to, to develop right in the open it's a lot more humbling you learn a lot you get a lot more of uh, external contributions and uh, so that's that's the way of the future I think for Microsoft and I think all open so or all software development mm -hmm. um, so they've they had .NET Core and they've had .NET Framework and now what they're going to be doing is they're going to they're going to have this uh, journey where they're bringing these two back kind of together and they're going to unify .NET again so Hmm. .NET 5 is basically getting rid of, uh, it's not really getting rid of .NET Framework, but it's it's saying that, you know, .NET Core and .NET Framework are kind of converging so that you're going to have one developer experience, right? So as a .NET developer, you're going to have all the, you know, productivity tooling and, um, you know, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, the .NET CLI, all these things that you've kind of learned to grow in love with, um, and it's going to be under one realm so that you'll be able to target any other platforms and do all the things that you were. So it's kind of the evolution of .NET coming to fruition. So there's a lot uh, of documentation around 
how we want to make sure we present that to all the .NET developers around the world. Well, that's interesting. I remember in the early days of .NET Core, one of the challenges was people would say, I, I really want to migrate to .NET Core because I have, for example, an application I want to deploy to UAs. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, I really, uh, or just maybe because it's just a new and shiny thing I want to stay up to date. But I need right. that thing right. that isn't yet available in .NET Core. And so I have to build some apps in .NET Classic. <laughs> right, <laughs> .NET Classic, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that was always uh, an interesting. Is what we settled on. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, that was one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, before joining Microsoft, I, I worked as a consultant and, you know, working with, you know, enterprise 500, enterprise 100 companies, whatever it was, you know, large scale enterprise application development for .NET, it was the same type of story. And it was, it's kind of ironic how uh, so many large companies are stuck in that same type of uh, motive where it's just like they can't get outside of themselves and they are they have these systems that are were developed from a POC years ago that have you've you know eventually become this uh, monolithic application and it's like they're stuck doing certain things in a certain way um, so it's really kind of eye-opening to see uh, all of the different enterprises that are actually stepping over into .NET Core and it's become a lot more prevalent now I think over the last five years it's it's almost uh, more of a rarity to see shops that are still kind of stuck in .NET framework. And uh, I think .NET 5 is going to be even even better. It's basically um, .NET Core v Next is what .NET 5 is going to be, essentially. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's what you just said is true, definitely for the new application development. People are yeah. uh, they're, they're not afraid to build new applications in .NET Core, but that uh, migrating old applications... There's, there's a lot of risk in that and a lot of uncertainty and, uh, and some hurdles. As I mentioned, if a feature isn't available, then you have to figure out a way around that. Yeah. At least yeah. that was true before. But you're saying it's not true now. You're saying that uh, when, or it won't be when .NET 5 comes about. But that'll make that like, migration easier. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, I think it was always as easy. It's just uh, the the I think so with .NET Core they introduced .NET Standard and .NET Standard is basically like the the contracts or right. the abstractions, the interfaces that sit on top of um, you know uh, the runtimes. So the runtimes are the implementations of .NET where .NET Standard mm -hmm. is. This is what the API surface area will look look like when it's running on this runtime. So with .NET Standard. Uh, if you had a .NET Framework 4.5 um, application and you wanted to port it over to .NET Core, you would use you know class libraries from .NET Standard, and you could say, okay, if the surface area of the API is um, compatible, then it should be fairly easy to kind of port over to it. And there was migration tooling and stuff like that. But um, I guess what I was trying to say with .NET 5 specifically is that it just continues to get better. Really, okay. that's fair. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the um, uh, the fact that it's being built kind of in the open. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're Microsoft. This was unheard of ten years ago, but uh, now Microsoft <laughs> is publishing things constantly uh, in making it available as preview, letting people look at, it, letting people look at the source code, even letting people contribute to the source code. Right, uh, it's crazy. Um, how, but how does that affect your job? The way that as you're as you're kind of following along behind that. Mm -hmm. and uh, understanding this and uh, making this more accessible to others. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, actually, because, you know, before joining Microsoft, we used GitHub um, and a lot of the different enterprise um, uh, applications that I would develop. It was That was our source control uh, provider, right? You would use GitHub or enterprise GitHub. Um, so you get really used to, like, this workflow, but you're confined to the team that is the engineers who are working on it. So... Now that it's uh, under Microsoft and it's completely public, anyone can see all of these inner workings, it becomes a whole new uh, animal. And I've actually developed uh, a conference talk that I'm excited to hopefully give here in the near future, which actually talks about um, open source um, ethics. And uh, hmm. there's, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting aspects to it. Uh, it's changed my, I guess, day job to, to really be a lot more humble. There's a ton of very, very intelligent people out there, and I've learned a lot just from people who will ask questions or who will 
um, you know, contribute something back to our docs or to the runtime or to the CLR or, you know, and uh, it's really, really cool. But um, as an aside, I actually had developed a profanity filter uh, during last year's hackathon. Okay. Um, I, I was working with Bill Wagner, uh, and what it was was... I've never heard Bill Wagner use any profanity yeah. in my entire life. <laughs> at least 15 years. No, no, it wasn't. So, yeah, he, he was uh, on the hackathon. I, I was part of his team. Um, but we had this idea where we would basically have an Azure function. And this is before um, GitHub Actions was introduced. So we had an Azure function and we had a GitHub webhook. So the webhook would fire when a pull request was um, requested or an issue was posted. And um, during either of those, uh, if the user who posted the issue or pull request had profanity in either the title or in the body text, we'd actually replace it, all the profanity, with emoji. Right. So <laughs> you as the consumer, right, when you see this person who comes into your um, uh, repository and they post an issue, because, uh, again, it's public, right? It's an open right. world. Anyone can go in there and do that. Um, it kind of takes the edge off a bit when you're consuming it because, you know, you, you start to get sensitive to these sorts of things and you kind of feel like, holy cow, this person's very, very angry. They're very upset, you know, and it kind of helps defuse the situation a little bit and makes it, you know, more approachable. Uh, rather than you, you know, opening up an issue and, or seeing someone who opened up an issue and they're just dropping f bombs left and right, and you're like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah. So replacing it with emoji makes it a lot like, ah, yes, they are definitely angry. <laughs> Let's work with them, right? Let's try to be empathetic towards that end user because clearly they're frustrated. And you know, what can we do to make their experience better? Yeah, so this is one of the ethical things you're talking about. Is that uh, people, some people are prone to use a lot of profanity and sometimes an indication of they're just ranting and really upset. We don't want right. to invalidate their, their anger because they, they may have a very legitimate reason for being anger, angry, but at the same time, uh, we don't want to offend people that are coming here for actual rational conversation with them. So maybe a little bit of humor. Like, is it the emoji exactly. with the with the cuss words across the mouth? Is that the emoji you use? No. So that's the that was actually the uh, we'd also automatically label it. So with issues and pull requests, you can add a label. So we would label it as profane content with ah. that little emoji, and that's what the bot was. It had that little uh, emoji, but. We were using random emoji for oh, okay. all the different the swear words. So there'd be like a pony, right, or <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Stuff that was more like, yeah, you, right, you, you giggle. So that's, that's what the idea was. What the rainbow pony is this? You were talking earlier off camera about uh, something called .NET Maui. What is yeah. that? Yeah, so .NET MAUI, uh, they're targeting it with .NET 6, and there's going to be some previews here towards the end of the year. And essentially what .NET MAUI is, uh, it stands for Multi-Platform App UI. Of course, we're great we're, uh, with acronyms, right? MAUI. Uh, I wish they could send us to Hawaii. That'd be better. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, uh, it's cross-platform. It's native UI. Um, and the idea is it's, it's just the evolution of what Xamarin Forms was. Uh, Xamarin Forms, uh, for the, the longest time, was uh, bridging the gap between um, Android and iOS and even the Windows experiences and uh, catering to developing from a single project, a single code base. And uh, so Maui is going to be like the evolution of that. And Xamarin's not going to go away. Xamarin will still be in LTS for a long time. But... Uh, with .NET 6, Maui is kind of where it's going to be at. That'll be so new application developments once .NET 6 and Maui come out will be done through Maui rather than Xamarin. Right. Okay. Uh, wow, interesting. Um, and now you also mentioned you have a show. Yes, yes. So uh, I, would, I would say rather recently, within the last few months here, uh, my co-hosts, uh, Scott Addy and Cam Soper and myself, we started um, what's referred to as the .NET Docs show. And there's been a little bit of misconception, so we're not great at branding things. Uh, so with the .NET Docs, it's not Docs as in we're from the Docs team, so we're going to talk all about Docs. Even though we do tie back to Docs, uh, it's kind of like a play on words, like the .NET Doctors show. Right, uh, we're, we're going to have like our segments. We're going to start having are going to be like 
the .NET checkup. Um, we're going to have um, a significant portion of the show is actually dedicated to like a virtual hallway track because everyone, you know, with no conferences right now, you're kind of missing that. Right. Uh, and I think some of the best conversations that you'd end up having are the hallway track. And, 100% uh, agree. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, reach out to uh, the developer community. We're trying to encourage um, adoption with .NET. Uh, we're highlighting some of the amazing open source projects out there today. Uh, we're, we're bringing uh, awesome folks on the show from Microsoft to talk about um, .NET and, you know, how you can use it and all the different you know, avenues. So it's, it's awesome. It's been great. We have a huge schedule actually coming up and we're already booking. Uh, I know it's just the beginning of July essentially, and we're already booking into uh, November. We actually have just one oh, date wow. left for November and then it's going to be into December. Is it weekly? Yeah. Every Thursday, uh, 11 AM U S central time. Oh, are you recording live? Yep. We stream oh, cool. live. Wow. What's the, uh, where do people find that? You can go to .net docs .dev, .net docs .dev. Uh, This is my second favorite technology pun on the word docs. It used to be a database and a programming language called Paradox. Have you ever familiar with Paradox? Oh my gosh, no, no. It was kind of like Access. It was a competitor to Access. Access okay. and then Foxpro and there was a whole bunch of them. And uh, I, the story I heard was it was called Paradox because it was invented by two PhDs. It was invented really? by a pair of docs. <laughs> I love that. Is, That's uh, <laughs> a docs pun. Yeah. From... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That used to be my favorite docs yeah. tech pun, but now I've, I've got a new one. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. All right, then, hey, well, before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, I don't. I can't think of anything off the cuff, so... This has been great. Thanks for having me. Outstanding. Thanks for being on my show, Dave. And you stay safe. Yeah, you too. Technology is where I found all of my friends through the developer community.